Hi, Bruce. Hi, Anand. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's very nice to have you today. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. Uh, so today my guest is Bruce Golden. He's the France Merrick Chair in Management Science in the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. His research interests include heuristic search, combinatorial optimization, networks, and applied OR. Bruce has received numerous awards, including the Thomas L. Satie Prize twice, the University of Maryland Distinguished Scholar Teacher Award, the Informs Award for the Teaching of OR MS Practice, and the Informs Computing Society Prize. In addition, in 2018, he was nominated and selected as a recipient of the George E. Kimball Medal for Distinguished Service to Informs and to the Profession of OR and Management Sciences. In 2019, he received the Robert Herman Lifetime Achievement Award in Transportation Science and Logistics. He was named an Informs Fellow in 2004 and a Verilog Fellow in 2017. Bruce has served as Editor-in-Chief of Networks from 1999 to 2022. Before that, he was Editor-in-Chief of the Informs Journal on Computing for seven years. In 1980, he founded a management consulting company on business logistics with several colleagues. Clients included IBM, UPS, the US Postal Service, the US Air Force, the US Army, Federal Express, Toyota, DuPont, and many others. In the late 1980s, Brusco founded a second company specializing in the design and sales of vehicle routing software. He and his partners successfully grew these companies and sold them in late 1998. So Bruce, after this very long introduction, uh, I would like to thank you once again for you know being here. It's such an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, um, well, it's my pleasure. Thanks very much for organizing this. Yeah. So let's start. Okay. Uh, Bruce, uh, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, late 1950 in Brooklyn, New York. Right. Uh, could you talk a bit about your parents? Yeah, uh, my mom and dad were from Brooklyn. Um, my my dad went to um, the army in the mid nineteen forties. Um, he he didn't actually fight in the war. He was scheduled to be shipped to Asia, but thankfully the war ended. So he served in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, for about half a year. Um, and then when the war ended, he came back to New York. Uh, my mom studied to be a nurse, and uh, she became a nurse uh, until I was born. Um, eventually, she went back to school, received a bachelor's degree, and became a public health nurse. My dad wanted to become an engineer. So he took an exam in New York. Um, there was a school called Cooper Union, and I believe it still exists, and it had a large endowment. So that if you could pass the entrance exam, you would be admitted uh, free of charge. My dad took the exam, and he passed, and he was very excited. Um, but his dad, my grandfather, and his uncle um, convinced him that he might be better off going into accounting because the engineering firms weren't hiring Jewish engineers in the late 1940s. Uh, so my dad went uh, to work and then at night he picked up a degree in accounting at New York University. Um, wow. So that's a little bit about my mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, do you have siblings? Yes, I have two younger sisters. And uh, they're, one of them is in New York, married with children and grandchildren. And the other one is in Florida, also with children and grandchildren. Okay. So, uh, your parents uh, obviously went through a lot, uh, including the Great Depression, I imagine, and yes. then the war. How did that affect in your upbringing? Well, I think the depression um, left an imprint uh, 
in my mom and dad's behavior from very little things to larger things. But we were always aware of the fact that uh, my mom and dad um, had been through a lot and were sort of working hard to provide for the three of us. Um, and, and if I left my bedroom with the lights on, you know, my dad would let me know that, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. That was a favorite expression. Um, but there were lots of ways in which um, they uh, in, in Stilled in us this notion that uh, we should be thrifty and careful. And to a certain extent, I think I've carried that with me. Um, my children will criticize me when I say something like, you know, turn off your lights, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. They'll, they'll laugh at me. They'll mm -hmm. think, you know, I'm from another time and place. And I'll laugh at myself, of course, because I, I recognize where it comes from. Um, but I know that uh, my, my parents uh, came from a much more difficult background than the one that I lived through, and certainly the one that my children have lived through. Yes. Um, and how was life in New York during the 50s and 60s? Well, I, I think if I try to compare it to the way life is today, um, it was much simpler. Um, it was a more trusting time. Um, we would uh, play sports all day and, and all night. And our parents, uh, at least seemingly, wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about us. Um, when I was 13 or so, the World's Fair came to New York. And I would get on the train as a 13-year-old, um, and I would take it to Queens and spend a day and part of the evening at the World's Fair and then take the train back at night. When I was a little bit older, I would take the train into Manhattan and I'd watch a basketball game at Madison Square Garden. And then I'd come home late at night. Um, so it was nice having New York close by. And I took advantage of the train system to see sporting events and watch movies. Um, and that was, that was nice. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the funny thing is that when I was in high school, I felt quite comfortable in New York and getting around New York. This is a little story that I'll tell you. Um, I went to school, uh, college in Philadelphia, and then I went to grad school in Boston. And after I graduated from MIT, I had a conference in New York. And I, I think I visited my parents. And from there, I took the train into New York. And um, at night, I found myself um, no longer comfortable riding the subway. It had been maybe eight years since I had done that on a somewhat regular basis. And so I found myself taking a taxi cab. And I thought to myself, wow, this is odd. I was so comfortable when I was 17. Now that I'm 25, you know, I'm not so comfortable. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, it was nice being so close mm -hmm. to Manhattan. So you were, I, yeah, tell me. Well, I also took advantage of the trains to get to Forest Hills when the U.S. Open was uh, mm. taking place uh, because I was a major tennis fan and I used to enjoy that. And my buddies and I would, would go there on a regular basis. Yeah, so you were really into sports at that time. Yes, I, I played sports. Um, all the time. I, I don't want to pretend that I was a great athlete. I was a good athlete, but I loved, I loved sports. Uh, so what type of sports did you use to practice? Mm. Well, I, I was a good uh, runner. So I was on my track and field team. Um, and I was also on my cross country running team. So I ran uh, distances from like the 200 
yard dash or 200 meter dash all the way up to several miles because cross country was um, something like three to five miles. Wow. Yes. Well, well, so I did that. I also played tennis. I, I played on my tennis team in high school and I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I enjoyed playing uh, ping pong. Later on, I enjoyed playing squash and racquetball and even pickleball. Um, so racket sports, um, I, I always enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed playing basketball. Um, and, you know, I played uh, on my school team until at the age of maybe 14, um, you know, my height sort of leveled, <laughs> leveled off. And uh, some of my friends continued to grow uh, taller and taller. Um, so... I, I always enjoyed sports, so uh, uh, maybe with one exception, and, and that was swimming. And I, we can come back to that later. Yeah, uh, let's talk about it now. I mean, uh, do you still keep yourself physically active? Uh, do you swim, for example? Yes, yes. It turns out that I uh, I swim almost every day, which is something that I never would have predicted as a as a 15 year old. Why? So. Uh, I had a friend when I was young who was a natural swimmer. His name was Johnny. And when we were 10 years old, he went to summer camp, came back and told me how he had been successful at swimming a mile at, at, at Boy Scout camp. And I was really impressed because at the time I, I couldn't swim. Um, so shortly thereafter, my parents suggested that I learn how to swim. And there was one high school near where we lived that had an indoor swimming pool. So I signed up for lessons and I was probably at my first or second lesson when I'm running alongside the pool and I slipped and I cracked my head. Um, I had to be rushed to the hospital where they shaved a good portion of my head and stitched my head. And I thought to myself, maybe I just wasn't meant to be a swimmer. <laughs> and so I tried to stay away from swimming for <clears throat> as long as I could. But when I, when I started college as a freshman, I discovered that they had a swimming test, which I had to pass. So since I couldn't swim, they um, insisted that I take a class with all of the other non-swimmers. And uh, the goal was to have us, by the end of the semester, spend an hour in this deep water pool without touching the sides of the pool. We could tread water, we could float on our back, we could swim laps, but we couldn't touch the sides of the pool. And to my amazement, within a short period of time, I could swim. And, and that was a, a, a pretty major uh, life lesson for me, um, that it was as simple as working hard at something, at, at trying it, at giving yourself a chance to learn and excel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I, I was a bit stunned at how easily I was able to sort of adapt. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what happened was I, I was running every day when I was a young adult until I reached the age of about 35. I would run every day. I would play racquetball three nights a week. And uh, one night playing racquetball, I sort of twisted my, my back. I went to the doctor and he said, look, um, you know, you're in your late 30s if you continue running every day, and I was running about five miles a day. He said, if you continue running every day and playing racquetball three days a week, you're probably going to do more damage to your back and maybe your knees as well. So he asked, is there another sport that you could spend uh, time at? And I thought, well, okay, I remember that uh, I learned how to swim. So let me try that again. So the funny thing is that here I am in my 70s, and for the last 36 years, 
I've been swimming the equivalent of a mile almost every day. And I, I never would have imagined uh -huh. that that would be the case. Um, but I enjoy it. I mean, I find it very relaxing. And um, when things are going well, not only can I swim, but I can then take a sauna for 10 or 15 minutes. And I leave the sauna feeling like a new man. Uh -huh. So I recommend it if you <laughs> haven't tried it. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you had this trauma, but then out of necessity, perhaps, you, you were kind of forced to adapt and overcome, um, you know, uh, what happened in the past. And then uh, it became possibly one of your very favorite hobbies. And, yeah. And that's very nice. Yeah. Okay. So it seems that uh, you grew up about a couple of blocks away from a very famous musician. <laughs> Yes, I did. Uh, Billy Joel uh, lived about a, well, a few blocks, maybe a quarter of a mile away from me, and we were in school together. And Billy Joel was always in a band, uh, and his band was always the best band in my hometown. I think uh, we could afford to hire him to play at school dances maybe once or twice a year. Um, And I, I have recollections of listening to him at Battle of Band competitions. Now, again, in the early 1960s, uh, a lot of young bands were trying to imitate the Beatles. Um, and these Battle of Band competitions would take place in um, like a school gymnasium. And there might be 20 bands there. And uh, all of the spectators would get to sort of cheer on their bands and uh, their favorite bands and, and vote on which band or bands they, they like most. And I can remember uh, Billy Joel and his band playing Summertime uh, from Porgy and Bess. And this was like after ninth grade. So we were 14, 15 years old. And I, I, I've always loved music, um, and I listen to music all the time. But I thought to myself that singing Porgy and Bess at a school band where everyone else is singing just pure rock is, you know, quite unique. But Billy Joel was great, and his band was the best around. Um, Funny story is that one of the songs that I love most of his is Only the Good Die Young. And he's talking about this girl, Virginia, you know, uh, come out, give me a sign. And basically, you know, he wants to date Virginia, but she's playing hard to get. And in fact, her mom wants nothing to do with, uh, with Billy Joel. Well, it turns out that Virginia was a real person. She was a friend of mine in high school. Wow. And she went to uh, our senior prom with an, another good friend of mine. Very nice. Um, but that's who, who he was singing about. I won't, I won't mention her last name. Uh, it starts with a C, but I won't mention her last name just because I don't want to embarrass her if mm -hmm. she ever happens to listen to this. But, of course, I've uh, enjoyed listening to his music uh, ever since. Uh, very, very talented fella. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm proud that he was from the same hometown as, uh, as I came from. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, having the chance to meet him and see him, you know, growing as a musician and becoming famous later and, uh, you know, being uh, very much successful uh, should have been really uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, story. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I love some of his music. I think some of it's quite exceptional. Yeah. So... Yeah, Piano Man and some others are really famous and, and really good songs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Zanzibar is one of his songs that tends to be a little bit jazzier. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that song. But he has many yeah, that are, that are, that are sure. great. Yeah. Um, in general, I mean, I listen to a lot of music. I listen to uh, classic rock, blues, jazz. I listen to world music. Um, So, 
Yeah, you have a very good musical taste. <laughs> I yes, can tell I, I, yeah. well, I, I really enjoy yeah. listening to music. And I used to play the drums, so that might have something to do with it. Yeah. So, Bruce, uh, did you like to read in those days? I, I think I've always enjoyed reading. Um, I typically uh, am always reading a book. Very often it's a, a mystery book. But sometimes, you know, I'll read uh, a nonfiction book and a mystery book simultaneously. Um, but yes, I, I've always enjoyed reading. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do well in school? Yes, I did well in school. Um, I think especially well in math and science, which should come as no surprise. Uh -huh. So you took advanced uh, classes in math? I, I did. I did. Um, I took the advanced classes that were offered, you know, in my high school. Um, and I think they prepared me reasonably well for college. Um, I think maybe one thing that uh, set me apart from some of my, uh, my friends was that I enjoyed reading math books while I was in high school, um, just on my own. I came across this book um, called Mathematics for the Millions by, I think, Hogden, uh, Lance Hogden. And it was... Um, and in fact, I have a copy in my study, but it was like a 700 page book and it covered, you know, a wide variety of topics from, you know, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, calculus, probability. And I think the purpose of the book was to uh, turn people on to mathematics who weren't professional mathematicians or engineers, but to just show them how exciting mathematics could be. And I, I loved the book. I mean, I could read a chapter at a time, um, and I would learn different things about different fields of math. And at some point, uh, I think I was a junior in high school, I spoke to my teacher and wondered whether I could teach a class. Teach? teach a class on sort of matrix algebra, because one of the chapters, I believe, covered matrix algebra. And this was something that we didn't do in high school. Yeah. <laughs> and amazingly, she said yes. And so I taught, you know, it was probably 50 minutes or an hour at most, but I had to prepare the lesson and I had to try to teach it in a way that, you know, my fellow students who hadn't read the same material could follow. And I, you know, I got a kick out of it. And of course, you know, she had to have been pretty special to have signed off on it. That's um, remarkable. Uh, I mean, it's unheard, <laughs> at least uh, uh, quite well, a unique it, experience. Uh, to the I think so. Yeah. I think so. I, but it, um, it was just clear to me that from a young age that I had an interest in this area. Mm -hmm. I also was interested in Lewis Carroll. <clears throat> he wrote these famous books through The Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland. <clears throat> and in fact, in my master's thesis, uh, I begin each chapter with a quote from Lewis Carroll. Ah. But what most people don't know is that he was also a pretty serious amateur mathematician. And he wrote these really interesting books on mathematics. And I purchased those books when I was in high school. And one of them was called Pillow Problems because he was an insomniac. And so late at night, he would, he would design problems and then try to solve them. And his solutions are in this book. And so when I was in high school, I would try to at least follow his solutions. And I would, I would um, sort of marvel at his cleverness uh -huh. in his solutions. So I, I did that outside reading when uh -huh. I was in high school. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Uh, why did you go to the University of Pennsylvania for your undergrad? I think mainly because it was a very good school. Um, it also was reasonably close to my home. Um, I had a high school girlfriend at the time, and that was important to me. Um, but 
it turned out to be a wonderful, a wonderful place for me to go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, right. I, you know, I think I, I, I got a great education there and I, I, I made some, some good friends and, um, and so it turned out to be a very smart decision on my part. Right. Uh, so we're talking about late 60s now, more or less. Yes. Uh, yes. I wonder uh, whether uh, you took any coding classes at that time by any chance? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I had no contact with computers in high school. But when I started at Penn as a freshman, I took a course in Fortran. And um, I I used that skill, you know, throughout my time at Penn. So it was very useful. Yeah, I can only imagine, right, you know, 1968, 1969, and, and you know, coding in those days should have been a real adventure. And, and were you exposed to R during your undergrad? Yeah, um, I guess in, in a number of ways. It turns out that in one of my coding classes, I had a project that, you know, I could choose to work on. And I picked up a book on big issues in operations research. And one chapter involved simulation. And one of the items that they discussed was the Buffon needle experiment. I don't know if you remember that, but it goes back to the 1600s or so where uh, Buffon had this board, a rectangular board with uh, stripes that were horizontal and a needle of a certain length. And the question was, if he flipped this needle, you know, many, many times, how often would it intersect one of these horizontal lines? And if you analyze this, taking into account the size of the, le- the needle, the separation of the lines, you come up with um, an estimate for pi. So it's all probabilities and trigonometry, but you can use this experiment to come up with an estimate for pi. And so what I did was I I repeated this experiment 10,000 times, which was a lot in 1970, (laughs) and I came up with a pretty good estimate. And I thought, wow, that's magic. So, so that was that was one thing. The other thing was that uh, in the middle of Penn's campus was the Wharton School, and so I got a job teaching statistics to uh, Wharton undergrads um, when I was probably a, maybe a junior uh, at Penn, and so I spent some time in the Wharton School, and as I, you know, started digging around a little bit, I discovered these courses that they offered at the graduate level, you know, courses in decision analysis, in queuing theory, in linear programming, um, etc. And I thought that was very interesting. It turns out that when I was a senior, I took many of those courses. So I I, I did take uh, courses that first year PhD students in OR at Wharton were taking. And some of the students in that class, I would see at INFORMS, of course it was ORSA, TIMS, and then INFORMS meetings for decades to come. And one of my professors, uh, John Casolino, uh, had come to Penn from MIT, and he did his PhD work with John Little. And so when it was time for me to apply to graduate school, John encouraged me to go to MIT. So uh, in addition to that, I had a friend who was also a math major. And the two of us discovered OR at Penn pretty much simultaneously. He went on to become a chair professor at Villanova University. And he and I would see each other every year at the INFORMS meetings. And so I've stayed in touch with him for 50 plus years. That's yeah. fantastic. I, I remember when you once said that OR is the right kind of applied math. And you probably figured that out around that time, right? So Yes. Yeah. For me, by the time I graduated from Penn, I was pretty confident that operations research would be a good match for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And it turned out to be a, a it, it, good call. It's, wor it's working so far. Yeah. Uh, so, Bruce, before we talk about your PhD years at MIT, I have to ask you about this. Uh, was it around that time that you decided to grow your very famous mustache? <laughs> Yeah, when I was at Penn, it was the late 1960s, early 1970s, I had long hair as, you know, many other uh, male students uh, had. And at one point, um, you know, I had long hair, I had a mustache and I had a beard. And the funny thing is, I thought I looked great. And then a few years later, I looked at a photograph of myself and I cringed. I thought I looked terrible. I looked like Charles Manson because you saw two eyes in a mass of facial yeah. hair. But but yeah, I guess I kept the mustache, but got rid of the beard. Yeah, that's your trademark. Uh, have you considered shaving it? Yeah, I do every once in a while. What happens is uh, most of my mustache is now gray and the texture is different from when it was black. Uh -huh. So it's, it's a different um, mustache from the one I had 20 years ago. Uh -huh. um, and I think sometimes maybe life will be a little simpler if I just shaved it, but I, I haven't yet had the strength to <laughs> follow through on that thought. Yeah. So now let's uh, go back to, to your academic trajectory. Um, you went to MIT in 1972 for a PhD. Um, tell me about your PhD research work. Okay, so so the first thing I did was I did a master's thesis. Um, uh, I yeah, was right. prior to the PhD, you did your master's, right? Okay, I did a master's yeah, thesis, yeah. and I worked in traffic equilibrium. Um, Tom Magnanti was my advisor, but I was really building on work that had been done by Stella de Fermos. Stella de Fermos was an assistant professor at the time at Brown University, which is just about an hour away from MIT. Um, and I applied that work to some port planning models that uh, I was looking at. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I enjoyed working with Tom and I decided I wanted to do a PhD dissertation with him. Um, and we had some funding, I should say he had some funding, from the American Newspaper Publishers Association. And um, he, he, he put me to work on uh, a problem involving the uh, delivery of newspapers on a daily basis for a very large urban um, newspaper uh, outfit. And instead of working in Boston, because that problem was probably too large for the technology of the time, we went to Worcester, Massachusetts, which I think is the second largest city in Massachusetts. And um, we worked with the Worcester Telegram and Gazette and their circulation department was happy to spend time with us. Eventually I put together this map which was in my apartment and it took up an entire wall. I had pins for every customer location. How many customers? Uh, something like 600, maybe more than 600. Now at the time that, that was a large vehicle routing problem. For sure. So we had to be careful in implementing algorithms to solve that. And, and what we did was we looked at um, sort of a single depot and a multi-depot version of this problem. I worked with uh, another student who was a master's student at the time, and we developed codes that could come up with reasonably, reasonably good solutions very quickly using computer science ideas. Um, now, of course, the major limitation was the limitation that existed everywhere in 1974 when we began this work, and that is that we didn't have um, a street network to work from. We had XY coordinates. The really sophisticated 
um, geographic information systems that you know we take for granted today didn't really start to emerge until I would say the mid 1980s. So 1974, things were still relatively <laughs> primitive. Yes, yes. So we worked with them. We came up with some interesting, um, some interesting routes uh, or pieces of routes. And then in other cases, our routes didn't make much sense because the road network was just more complicated. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was a good learning experience. And we had taken the step of um, looking to computer science to figure out how we can make some of our algorithms more practical mm -hmm. in terms of running times. Mm -hmm. And I looked at a variety of related topics in the dissertation. Uh, but in general, you know, I, I enjoyed working with Tom. Um, and, and it was a good, positive experience. Um, right. So you, uh, you started your VRP saga around that time in the mid-70s? Uh, 1974, I think. Yeah. I think was the beginning. So and next year? Of course, at the time, at the time um, vehicle routing research was um, a rare event. Um, there weren't a lot of people looking at these issues. Um, in fact, the first few informs, of course, ORSA meetings that, that I attended, there were maybe two to five papers on vehicle routing topics. So I knew everyone who was working in this area on a first name basis. Um, the other thing I would say is that the research wasn't terribly exciting. You know, from today's vantage point, it was fairly one dimensional. It was focused almost entirely on sort of the spatial dimension. You know, what are the distances? Um, <clears throat> and things changed a little, little bit for me while I was a PhD student. So one of the nice things about being a PhD student at MIT was there were lots of interesting people who would stop by and give seminars. And probably in 1974, as I was getting into routing and scheduling, uh, Ed Beltrami from Stony Brook gave a seminar on work that he was doing with Larry Bowden. And they were basically looking at the period vehicle routing problem. The title of the paper, uh, I think, involved um, garbage collection. So you had customers, but these weren't customers who demanded service every day. You needed to visit some customers once a week, some customers twice a week or three times a week, maybe others five times a week. And you could choose, you know, once you're given the frequency, you could choose the specific days. So for a twice a week customer, you could choose a Monday, Thursday or a Tuesday, Friday. And so you had to choose the assignment of days such that you took advantage of the spatial savings that would accrue if the customers on a particular day were close together. So all of a sudden, this introduced another dimension. So you had time as well as the spatial dimension. And even though today, um, you know, young researchers would say, okay, what's the big deal? Back in 1974, that was a big deal to me. That was eye-opening because I saw that, okay, there's a lot more that, uh, that I can see happening in this vehicle routing space. And that was the, the, sort of the first inkling that this was bigger and broader than what I had envisioned sort of up to that point in time. Yes, that's re remarkable. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so next year, you're completing 50 years of uh, VRP. So maybe you can consider writing a memoir or uh, uh, 
you know, a biogra biographical paper, or, you know, 50 years of routing, something like that. Jules Bellaporte did yeah. something similar uh, um, about his, yes. you know, career. But then I think you can put a lot of emphasis on routing because you are one of the legends uh, in, in the field. So I think it would be very nice. Uh, so uh, uh, did you find a position at the University of Maryland right away or did you apply elsewhere after finishing your PhD? Yeah, I, I applied to a number of schools. Um, I remember I was interested in the University of Virginia. Uh, Princeton had an opening in the civil engineering department. So that's the department that eventually Warren Powell yeah. uh, worked at. Um, and there were a few other schools, uh, but I, I felt comfortable at Maryland probably because Saul Gass had just come to Maryland as the department chair. And, you know, he was a really nice guy, um, as well as a very sort of visible operations researcher. <clears throat> but I connected with him, you know, almost immediately. The other thing is that my wife had gone to school in Washington, D.C. So I had spent time traveling from uh, Boston to Washington, D.C., and I, I liked the area. So it wasn't really a difficult decision for me. Although, you know, it's funny. Uh, a lot of what I love about Maryland, I didn't really know about when I joined. I mean, it's like that everywhere, I'm sure. Uh -huh. um, but I didn't realize that Maryland had such a great applied mathematics and scientific computation program. And that's been, you know, one of, one of my great joys because at least half of my PhD students come from that program. And I guess what I love about that program uh, more than anything is that the students that I work with from that program, they think like I thought when I was their age. I mean, it's, it's sort of, they have the same mindset that, that I recall having. So it's very easy for me to connect with them. And, um, you know, many of them I'm still in touch with even after 30 or 40 years of their having defended a dissertation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, excellent. Yeah. I can see that you really connect with your students and yeah. Yeah. Right. And you'll see also that I've, I've stayed at Maryland. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had opportunities to leave, but I've stayed uh, because I like the area. Um, I like my colleagues uh, and I'm generally happy, although I have my gripes, uh, <laughs> which I won't go into here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Bruce, uh, I would like you to comment on two fundamental early VRP references that you were directly involved with uh, during the 80s. The first concerns the 1983 paper titled Routing and Scheduling of Vehicles and Crews with over 100 pages and about 700 references. I, I think it was the reference at that time on VRP. And the second one is the book published in 1988 titled Vehicle Routing Methods and Studies. Okay. Um... So what happened is I'm going to have to weave some other events, historical sure, sure. events, Please. into the answer. Okay. So what, what happened was in uh, the late 1970s, we built a group at Maryland that consisted of myself, Larry Bowden, Arjang Assad, and Mike Ball. And Larry and I were already in routing and scheduling, and we convinced Mike and Arjang to join us. So we started out by working as consultants for a larger company. So we were subcontractors. This larger company brought some really interesting vehicle routing problems to our attention. And we would design algorithms. And then he, this fellow who um, we subcontracted with, would take care of the IT issues. Um, and in the end, the projects went well. We did some interesting work. Um, he got most of the money, and we got a small piece of it. 
And after about three of these projects, we said, now, wait a second. <laughs> you know, we may not be geniuses, but it's pretty clear that we don't need him <laughs> to do what we're doing. Uh, why don't we form our own company? So by 1980, we had our own company. We had a PhD student of ours working at that company. And throughout the 1980s, we were in a really nice position because we were working on consulting projects from all different types of companies. And they were bringing new vehicle routing problems to us. Um, and so we were being exposed to these really interesting issues that uh, the vehicle routing literature was largely oblivious of. Um, and so throughout the 1980s, we were becoming, you know, experts, consulting experts in, in vehicle routing. And occasionally we'd be able to publish an article based upon a project that we worked on. So, um, first of all, we were called upon to give presentations on vehicle routing. In fact, some of the companies paid us to speak to their staff for a day on vehicle routing. So we generated slides. In many cases, these initial slides were by hand. But we generated slides on different topics in vehicle routing. Um, and then Informs um, put together some workshops, maybe the day before the conference began. And they would pay us a small amount of money to run an eight-hour workshop. And so we did this a few times. So by the early 80s, we had a pretty, um, pretty good knowledge of the field uh, from the literature. Plus, we knew a lot of what was being requested uh, from companies out there in industry. So we had this idea. I think Larry and I had this idea of putting together an article. Of course, you know, <laughs> that 20-page article grew to be 40 pages and then 60 pages and then I think 150 pages. Yeah. So it just kept growing. And instead of stopping, we just said, let's just go with the flow. And when we were finished, I think we went to operations research and said, are you interested? They said, no, it's too big. We're not interested. And the second uh, editor-in-chief we went to was Sam Raff at Computers and Operations Research. And we met with him and explained you know, what the paper was all about. And he said, I'm interested. He was definitely interested. And, um, and he was great. He said, I'll devote the entire issue to this, you know, article. So, so that was, uh, you know, in the early 80s. Um, the other thing is that we, we have this, uh, this wonderful special issue that Larry Bowden and I put together in, uh, I think it was 1981. But it was based on a conference, maybe the first international workshop on vehicle routing ever, that Larry and I organized with funding from the National Science Foundation. I think Sol Gas was also involved in the fundraising. Um, but it took place in College Park in 1979, and we had the best people in vehicle routing at the time at this conference. And the special issue was published in 81. It was amazing. And I think the issue or articles in the issue have been cited 5,000 to 10,000 times. So uh, again, uh, I think the four of us were in an almost unique position because number one, we were on top of the academic literature but we were also consulting. And so we got to see the kinds of problems that the field was not addressing. And we started to address them in some of the consulting work that we did. Um, now, in the 1980s, I think the field exploded um, for a number of reasons. Um, 
one of them had to do with the technology. The, the first personal computer that was, that was sort of practical was the IBM PC, which came out in about 1982. And at about the same time, you had a number of companies who had spun off from the U.S. Census Bureau. And they developed this field of uh, GIS, Geographic Information yeah. Systems. And as PCs became more and more sophisticated, it was only natural to think of marrying this PC technology with this GIS technology. So by the end or mid to end, uh, really the middle of the 1980s, you all of a sudden had geographic databases that could be used to solve real world problems with street networks. So you had that, you had that taking place. You had a lot of venture capital. Um, and so we were approached by venture capitalists. Um, other companies were approached to compete with us. Um, so the field was developing. Uh, our academic peers were responding. For example, we had uh, peers at Georgia Tech. I don't know if you remember, but at Georgia Tech, they had a very strong group of yeah. vehicle routing specialists. Sure, sure. Yeah. They formed their own company. They had specialists at the University of Montreal that formed their own company. We were competing against one another. Plus, you had venture capitalists funding companies that were not tied to academics. So it was very competitive. There was a lot of business taking place. And uh, by the late 1980s, it was time for another book because the knowledge had sort of Explode. grown at such a rapid pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arjang and I were sort of eager to try to catalog that. Um, so that was the 1988 uh, book. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, so Bruce, uh, you have been responsible for proposing very important VRP variants like the fleet size and mix VRP. Uh, and I work on that problem myself. Uh, yeah. The team orienting yeah. problem, the consistency VRP, to name a few. Uh, would you like to cite those that you find it more relevant? Or you have any favorites? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's hard to pick favorites because there's a, a bias <laughs> in favor of the more recent papers. I mean, I forget some of the papers from 25, 35 years ago. Um, I mean, I think that uh, we were trying to connect with real world issues, okay? So, you know, the fleet size and mix problem was a reflection of the fact that it's not just the cost of traveling on a road network on a particular day that's important. I mean, you have to pay for the vehicles, you have to pay for the crew. Um, another topic that we looked at uh, in a paper from, I think, 1983 that appeared in Decision Sciences involved vehicle fleet mix with a ca common carrier option. And the problem there, and this was based on a consulting project um, also, The problem there um, involved a, a fleet that was going to service most of the demand, but when there was a surge, they were going to rely on common carriers to sort of pick up the uh, rest of the demand. And, and so we had to come up with a methodology to decide, well, okay, which demand do you leave over? And which demand do you service with your own fleet? And mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, I mean, that paper was probably three decades ahead of its time. Um, but, you know, we looked at problems like that, the inventory routing problem, which is a well-known problem today. 
really stems from two real-world projects that we were involved with, again, in the early 1980s. One of them involved Amerigas, which was a company in Pennsylvania. Um, we worked with them to come up with a better way of delivering liquid propane. And the other one involved Amerigas, I'm sorry, um, Air Products, Air Products. Air Products had a really interesting uh, distribution problem. And we uh, were asked to put together a proposal to work on that project. And there were a number of companies that did. In the end, it turned out that we were finalists. Uh, but the, uh, the job went to Marshall Fisher and his group at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I wasn't very happy at the time because we had put a lot of energy into our proposal. But I, I did read the paper that appeared in Interfaces uh, by Marshall and his co-authors years later. Uh, and, you know, I have to take my hat off to them. They did a hell of a job. Mm -hmm. But those were two... Those were two inventory routing problems that we had been involved with. And um, I, I, I don't remember whether we named it the inventory routing problem or not. But we had a paper, I think, in 1984. I think Marshall's paper came out a year or two earlier. But, you know, in most of these cases, the, the paper really stemmed from a real-world problem. The consistent VRP uh, was, uh, was the same. I mean, companies like UPS, you know, had this notion of consistency. And um, we sort of asked ourselves, how would we come up with consistent routes, given a definition that was more or less compatible? with uh, the one that they used. And we came up with a paper that, you know, I like very much. I mean, that first paper on the consistent VRP, I like that. Uh -huh. um, there was another paper, the balanced billing VRP, which appeared in networks uh, at about the same time, roughly 2010. I, I like that paper uh, also because it stems from a real world problem faced by meter reading companies. Um, and in general, I guess I, and I don't always follow my own advice because I'm also uh, interested in solving problems that are just sort of mathematically interesting or challenging. But in general, um, I figure that if I'm going to spend a year working on a challenging problem, uh, why not have it be practical or as close to practical as, as possible? Mm -hmm. um, so those are some examples, I think. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving out uh, many because, as I said, um, I mean, I could talk about two recent papers just to convey a message that I think is important. Uh, I have two papers, very recent papers, um, that also stem from a real world scenario. One of them is under review and it deals with um, a logistics network for flying taxis. And it's based upon work that we did um, <clears throat> with Uber. Uber has a ground fleet of essentially taxis. Now, Suppose they could connect with a fleet of flying taxis at certain hubs. So to be real specific, um, I am fortunate in that I live in a location where there are three nearby airports. One of them is Dulles Airport, which is about an hour away. But if I want to travel internationally, Dulles is a good airport for me to travel from. So if I could take an Uber 20 minutes and then take a flying taxi Uber another 20 minutes to Dulles, that would make my life easy because it's not just the distance. The Washington, D.C. Beltway can be incredibly congested 
And very often when I come home on a Friday afternoon or Friday evening from an overseas trip, and then I have to wait an hour and a half to get home via taxi, you know, I dream of this uh, flying taxi, which might have made my trip so much more convenient. So the question is, how do you imagine a network that connects the ground fleet and the air taxi fleet um, with the demand and the cost? And so we... We've written a paper in which we do some heuristic uh, computations. We do some MIP computations. And the key point is that it's based upon a real-world problem, maybe not currently, but you have to think that within five or ten years, something like this will come about. Another paper which has just been accepted, uh, we call the Rendezvous Vehicle Routing Problem. And this comes from the following real-world conversation. Okay, a major logistics provider asks the question. Suppose we generate our routes and they're ready to go at 6 in the morning. But we have new demands that come between 6 and 10 in the morning. Would it be possible, as we're sending our trucks out and they're saturating the region, would it be possible to take care of the new demands by connecting them to trucks that are on their way to streets where these demands are destined for. How would we develop algorithms to solve that problem? In the worst case, if it turns out that all of the trucks have passed the customer's destination, well, then a shuttle would have to make a delivery. But it would be more economical if the shuttle could sort of drop off these new demands along the way. And again, it's a real world problem. It comes from a discussion with you know, a major logistics provider. And I try to, I, I, I try to take advantage of these emerging real world problems whenever I can. Yeah, you were definitely a visionary. And I mean, if one uh, just go through your the body of work, especially on routing problems, that's that's very clear, you know, over 40 years that you have been contributing and introducing new variants. And uh, it's just it's just remarkable work, Bruce. Um, and, anyway, you know, talking about relevance, uh, I know that's a very hard question I'm going to ask, but could you please highlight your main methodological contributions? We talk a lot about problems, but you know, let's talk about the, 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 the methods, algorithms, models you've proposed over the years. Do you have any, again, favorites or some, that's, some that stand out? Yeah. Well, I, I think, um, you know, I, I guess I've always thought of myself as an applied operations researcher. Um, more than many of my friends, um, I've been, I guess, uh, an, an admirer of uh, techniques from statistics as well as optimization. So even dating back to my dissertation, you know, I looked at things like extreme value statistics. Um, I, I use regression uh, in the work that I do. I spent a fair amount of time um, working with neural networks, believe it or not, in the 1990s. Again, I have a story. I, I may be taking too long with my stories. Uh, <laughs> So here's the story. I, I, I had uh, a contract with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. In Maryland, we have the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay is a very large estuary, and it, um, it employs a lot of uh, residents in Maryland. And boating is a major sort of hobby and activity in Maryland. And... Um, the department wanted to know if we could develop a tool that would uh, predict or estimate the salinity, the salt measure, at any location in the bay, at any depth in the bay, and at any time of year. 
okay? And they gave us 40,000 observations approximately back in 1990. So we were working on a PC back in 1990, and that was a large data set. So we used regression, um, you know, we used transformed variables, and, you know, we did all the things that you're taught in a graduate course in regression and developed some nice models that were pretty lean. So, you know, six independent variables and 40,000 observations and R squared values of between six and like 0.6 and 0.75. We were very happy. The department was very happy and um, we moved on to our next activity. So I was teaching a course and uh, a student from applied math uh, came up to me and said, would you be interested in um, supervising my master's thesis? And I said, yes, because she was a very good student. I said, what did you have in mind? And she said, well, I've been doing some work with neural networks. And I said, well, you know, I'm happy to help you, but I don't know anything about neural networks. So you're going to have to teach me. She said, fine. So she explained to me what they were about, what the goal was. And I said, okay, this will work out well because I have a data set. And it's a pretty rich data set. It's got 40,000 observations. Let's see how neural networks do in comparison with regression. So within two months, she had better results. Better results than the regression results, which I had been quite proud of. Uh -huh. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm on board. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe that, that, that this can help with, um, you know, prediction. And we were talking about, you know, uh, back propagation. Um, and we explored ways of um, improving standard backpropagation algorithms, which had been in the neural network literature for a couple of decades. She had to implement the, the algorithms. There were no libraries at the time largely Correct. available as uh, current days. So it Correct. was a hell of a work. Yes. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a very good student, and I wanted her to work with me on a PhD but I think she was getting married and he was moving to the West Coast, so that never happened. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I, I've always been interested in uh, prediction uh, and estimation, and um, I've come back to that recently in some of the work that I've done um, where we're trying to estimate um, optimal solutions to a variety of different types of combinatorial optimization problems and using statistical ideas we can come quite we can we can get quite close to optimality within two percent or sometimes even even better than that um, I've you know I've used heuristics I've used uh, integer programming I like the notion of Worst case analysis, even yes. though I know this I know is that. sort of at the opposite end of the spectrum from mm -hmm. the practical work that I do. Uh, what can I say? It's hard to be consistent. <laughs> but I, I, like, I like when you're able to perform a worst case analysis. Um, and in fact, I'm working on a paper now with a colleague from Italy where we do just that. Mm -hmm. So I've worked on, you know, all of those uh, – different topics. But unlike some of my friends, I don't consider myself to be sort of an applied, you know, integer programmer. Um, you know, and I'm not a statistician. Um, but I, I like solving a variety of problems. Some of the work that I've done uh, has used a variety of these techniques uh, almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Bruce, anyone who has uh, seriously worked on VRPs is certainly familiar uh, with the famous golden instances uh, that were proposed for several variants, including the CVRP. Uh, yeah. For nearly 20 years, they were the most famous large size instances used to test heuristics uh, until the, the, our group in Brazil proposed the X instances in a work led by Eduardo Shoa. 
the golden instances have a very peculiar geometric format. Uh, could you comment a bit about them? Yes. Well, uh, again, um, most of these instances were generated um, without access to a database, right? So nowadays, you know, it wouldn't be uh, uncommon to just take a look at, you know, uh, a square or a rectangle of streets in Manhattan or in Rio or anywhere else in the world and uh, generate points and solve the resulting traveling salesman problem. Uh, back uh, then, when we started, what we wanted to do was we wanted to generate these instances in a simple way. So, for example, if I generate an instance, I, I want to generate a family of instances so that you can specify a value of n and the family just grows. Okay, so we wanted to have that property. And the second property was that by taking advantage of symmetry, <clears throat> it should be possible to almost observe uh, by inspection, of course, after you've thought about it a bit, what an optimal solution or near optimal solution might look like. And it turned out that even though you might be able to observe what this near optimal solution looked like, it wasn't easy for the algorithms to find that same solution. So the instances turned out to be challenging. Um, they were also easy to store. I could give you a pseudocode which would tell you how to generate mm -hmm. the, the data points. Um, so I think it was, it was very convenient. Um, and it was concise and com compact, and it had this property of always allowing us to generate larger instances once the technology, you know, outgrew the smaller instances. So, uh -huh. so Bruce, uh, you co-founded two companies related to logistics and vehicle routing over the course of your career, and I believe that explains why you came up with so many VRP variants. Uh, but tell me a little bit about their story and, and how that have impacted your professional and personal life. Yeah. Um, well, we founded the company back in 1980. Uh, there were four of us as founders. And, of course, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, I was teaching in a business school, but I had never taken a business course. So... We, we learned by, uh, by doing, essentially. Um, and when you run a company, you have to learn uh, about marketing and accounting. Um, you have to learn about organizational structure. I mean, how do you maintain morale? Um, how do you finance the company? How do you negotiate contracts? How do you interact with lawyers? Um, how do you deal with um, clients who don't pay you or who renege on contractual obligations? How do you deal with uh, the competition? Um, and, you know, we had, to, we had to deal with all of that. And it was uh, time consuming, but, you know, more than that, it was stressful. And I guess we were young. And we were able to share the stress to a certain uh, degree. Um, but in terms of learning about routing and scheduling, I think a nice example is uh, a paper that I wrote with Ed Wassell in the mid 80s. It appeared in Operations Research. And it basically had to do with period vehicle routing in the soft drink industry. And, and what happened was um, we got a contract from the soft drink industry to let them know what was available in sort of vehicle routing and scheduling software and what problems in the soft drink industry could that software address. So we wrote a report for them and they paid us for our efforts. And then we submitted, we, we of course, consolidated the report um, 
and submitted it for publication uh, in operations research. But the point is that if you look at that article, you'll see that there were, I don't remember, but maybe there were five or six examples, and each example was a little bit different. It was a slightly different rooting problem. But we were, um, we were seeing these rooting problems as they were emerging long before, you know, our colleagues in the literature were writing about them. And so it was great for us in the sense that we could preview these problems. Now, sometimes there were constraints. So, for example, we weren't necessarily allowed to talk about a problem if we had a contractual obligation not to say anything about it. So we did some work on time windows in the 1980s that we could never talk about because we had a contractual obligation not to talk about that. But I think um, running the company was, as I said, it was stressful, it was painful. I mean, let, let me try to be concrete because maybe most of your viewers don't have the experience of, of running a company, okay? Consulting companies have, um, they have obligations that um, involve uh, payments on a regular basis, okay? So we had 20 people working for us. Um, we had a lease, a uh, three-year lease. And so every month we had a payment on the lease and we had electricity and we had 20 uh, workers who expected a paycheck every two weeks. And sometimes we didn't have enough money. And that's, that's true of every small business. See, most people who don't run a small business don't appreciate how stressful it is. I can remember going to sleep thinking to myself, okay, how are we going to make payroll this week? And then if we can squeeze together enough, how are we going to make payroll two weeks from now? And you may have customers who owe you money. So on the books, you, you know that you have enough money, but until that money arrives, you can't use it. Now, what you can do is you can go to your bank and borrow. So we had to establish a line of credit with the bank and then we had to personally guarantee that. So what that means is that if I want to borrow $50,000 from the bank, they'll say, sure, borrow $50,000. But if my company can't pay it back, then Bruce Golden has to pay it back, right? Uh -huh. So that stress was always there. We went a year without paying ourselves simply because the money wasn't there. And not only did we not pay ourselves – but we wanted to keep the fact that we weren't doing well from our employees because we didn't want to lose them. They were good, hardworking, talented employees. And if we lost them, we'd have to hire new ones and then train them for years. So we did our best to keep from them the fact that we weren't paying ourselves and business was not looking very good. And once a year when they wanted pay increases, you know, I had to grit my teeth. I mean, I felt like saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> I can't pay myself and you want a 4% salary increase? Mm -hmm. But I had to restrain myself because again, I wanted to keep them. And, and so my partners and I went through some tough times. Um, but I think that's the nature of a small business. And we learned that firsthand. Um, eventually, you know, we grew the business. Um, we sold the business in 1998. And that was the toughest thing I've ever done because I had to satisfy, I was the president. I had to satisfy my partners. I had to satisfy the other side. I had to deal with the lawyer every day. You know, I always had messages waiting for me. It was a great learning experience, but after we had sold the company, my life became so quiet mm. in, in a nice sense, but it was like an amazing transition. Mm -hmm. um, and also it probably made you a better 
uh, teacher, right? Because you were teaching in a business school, so you had this wide range of experience, practical experience. So I'm sure that probably had influenced you, right? Uh, There's no question. I mean, I, you know, I had, I had stories, you know, that were fairly recent and that were relevant that I could share with my students. And I also, I had my former employees who continued working with the company um, who I could call upon to come to my class and talk to my students, especially my PhD students. And I, I think I've sent six PhD students in OR to this company. So my fingerprints are all over the company. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Still. Mm -hmm. So Bruce, I met you in person for the first time uh, in 2011 uh, in Sitges in, in Spain. Oh, yes. uh, I remember I asked you some details about a paper that you had published at that time in MathPro Computation. <laughs> Uh, with your former PhD student, Chris Grohr. Uh, it seems that he has a very unusual background for someone in our field. Yes, yes, he does. Um, yeah, so Chris wrote uh, that paper where essentially he made public a very sophisticated vehicle routing software package yeah. uh -huh. um, available to the public um, and many researchers have actually used it since then um, and he also worked on a very interesting paper involving parallel computation because he um, let's see he worked at NSA for a while uh, but I should go back uh, earlier Chris was uh, a star tennis player in college and he became a professional tennis player. And um, he probably played professional tennis for a few years. And I don't know his, his top uh, ranking, but he has some wonderful stories of having played a very young Leighton Hewitt from Australia. And Chris told me that he knew almost immediately that this young kid was capable of doing great things. Um, I think he played Andy Roddick as well at at one point. Um, I hope he survived the the serve. The serve, right? <laughs> the serve, right, right, right. Yeah, even later he went to become number one, right? Also, so, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, he won. I think several Grand Slams, mm -hmm. and Andy won one, yeah. I believe. Um, so Chris came after after. Let me see. He got a master's in pure mathematics, I think, at the University of Georgia. And then uh, he was working at um, NSA in Maryland uh, and went back to uh, get a PhD in applied math at Maryland. And I met him early on. Um, you know, he did a, a really nice job as a PhD student. Um, and then, you know, he went to, I believe, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He had gotten into parallel computing as a PhD student. Um, he did more of that at the Oak Ridge National Labs. He then went to work for a consulting company. Um, he got involved in applying parallel computing to schedule uh, games for sports conferences. Um, he was successful at doing that, but then took a job at Salesforce. He became a vice president in charge of route optimization, and he was essentially in charge of a routing and scheduling team. And from what I gather, they had some really interesting routing and scheduling problems that they worked on. He stayed there for maybe five years. Um, and now he's back uh, in business um, with some partners. They've raised some venture capital. And they're working full time to schedule games for the NBA, the NHL, um, other professional sports and college sports leagues. 
And of course, they use combinatorial optimization and they use parallel computing in a very sophisticated way. Um, and they're probably the best in the world at doing this. That's amazing. I mean, it's like a dream job. I, mean, I love sports and, uh, and, and OR. So, I mean, to be able to put the, the two together is just incredible. Yeah. I should talk he to also Chris told eventually. Me, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you should talk to him. He also told me that when he started discussing scheduling the NBA games um, with the key players, the fact that he had been a professional tennis player, even though he hadn't been a top 10 or top 100 player, he felt that it helped him. It, it gave him sort of a, a bit of, um, well, they took him a bit more seriously oh. because he was a professional athlete also. Yeah, I see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, Bruce, uh, uh, you spent a good portion of your career in editorial roles. Uh, yes. most notably serving as editor-in-chief of Inform Journal Computer for seven years and also editor-in-chief of Networks for over 20 years. What can you share from this fast experience, including the positive and negative aspects? Yeah, so I think I started in 1992 as an editor-in-chief and I ended at the end of 2022, so about 31 years. Um, well, you know, I... I I enjoyed being an editor-in-chief. Um, now, again, it was stressful from time to time. Um, and it certainly has its, uh, its benefits and its drawbacks. Um, so let me start with the, uh, the, the drawbacks. As I said, it, it, it can be stressful. You have to deal with um, publishers. Um, you have to deal with the associate editors. I mean, sometimes you have an associate editor who maybe gets divorced or who has some kind of a health problem and is no longer paying attention, okay? And that person is handling 15 articles. Um, you have difficulties with uh, authors. Um, so, for example, in the last few years, I had an author who threatened to sue me. Okay, what happened was the associate editor and the referees recommended acceptance. And I overruled them. I said, I don't think this paper is a very good match for networks. And uh, I'm going to reject it. And the author was really annoyed. That's putting it mildly at me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he wrote me some sort of nasty emails and threatened to sue me. Now, I mean, this is, these kinds of things happen. If you're editor in chief, you're making decisions that impact people, possibly in a major way. I've had other people, even friends of mine, who were upset with me because I rejected their papers. In other words, it's almost like they expected me, since we're friends, to overrule the views of the associate editor and the referees. And, you know, I have done it from time to time, but it's got to be for a good reason, and it's got to be an exception. Um, so when you're editor-in-chief, sometimes you're going to have to make decisions that your friends will disagree with. And sometimes they'll disagree with it you know, in a nasty way. That just comes with the job. Um, and so I know that, you know, in a similar way, I mean, I've had disagreements with other editors who rejected my paper. And, you know, I always, you know, insist on being civil. You know, I'll explain why I think he or she has made a mistake I'll see if they want to revisit it, but if not, you know, I just, I just drop it. I mean, that's, that's it because, back I, because I know what it's like when, you know, a friend of yours is giving you a hard time for essentially doing your job. So that, that happens. And of course, beyond that, there's the, 
stress of managing the backlog. So to give you some context, if you happen to be the editor-in-chief of Transportation Science, because it's an informs journal, there's always a large enough backlog, right? Um, everybody wants to publish in one of the informs journals. But as editor-in-chief of Networks or, you know, another non-affiliated journal, you've got a backlog that will, you know, grow large and small um, and the market takes a look to see what the backlog is and if it's too long authors will submit their article elsewhere um, and so as an editor-in-chief you've got to be always watching that backlog closely because every six and a half weeks I had to produce another issue and and what that means is that you can't go away for two weeks and not work on the journal. You've got to be working on it all the time. And, you know, some people will ask, well, how much time does it take? And my answer is it certainly takes time. How many hours a week? I don't know exactly. It varies also depending upon the backlog. If the backlog is low, well, then you've got to be creative. You've got to generate special issues and uh, articles. And if you're doing your job well, you're anticipating this months in advance. Okay. But it's not so much the time as the stress. At least I found that to be the case. Um, when I have to deal with an author who's threatening to sue me, you know, or I have a backlog that's getting thin and I know that the special issue that I'm working on is not going to be ready for another four months, then, you know, I, I start to sweat a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the stress is always there. Um, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to sort of influence the field. Um, you can decide on putting together a special issue on trucks and drones before anyone else because it's something that you feel strongly about. And then once you do that, not only does it send a signal to the community that Networks is interested in these kinds of articles, but it sends a signal more broadly that, you know, this is a topic that, you know, journals are taking seriously. Um, you know, we we published early special issues on vehicle routing problems with with time windows. We also went out of our way to publish single articles, either survey articles, like arc routing articles that were maybe 50 pages in length, um, or articles on a wide variety of topics that I or you know, one of my colleagues at Networks listen to at a conference. And, you know, if I hear a talk that I really like, uh, you know, I, I would go up to the author afterwards and say, listen, I like the material that you presented. I'd like to publish it in Networks. And here's an incentive. Okay. If you send me your article, I will have it reviewed in one month and I will fast track it so that we publish it within six months or nine months or something like that. Uh -huh. And many times, um, you know, the author says yes. Or if it's a conference that I haven't attended, but I've seen it online, I will contact the author and try to get that author to submit the paper to networks. And once I submit, an, once that article is submitted and published in networks, again, it sends a signal to the community that, okay, Networks is interested in these kinds of articles. Um, so I think that's, there's a feeling of satisfaction that you get when you see um, that you're publishing articles um, or a cluster of articles or a special issue on a topic before, you know, some of your competing journals have thought to focus on that. I'll, I'll give you another story. I mean, just as I have overruled um, 
associate editors and referees uh, and recommended rejection, I've gone the other way. Um, so there was a famous paper from the 1980s. I was the area editor of operations research. And uh, this article was on uh, vehicle routing with time windows. It's like the first one uh, written by Marius Solomon. It's a classic. <laughs> and a classic article. It's been cited thousands of times. Yeah. The referees said reject it. The associate editor said reject it. And I overruled them. And I accepted the paper. And let's see, how many years later was it? Well, in 2010. So that article came out in the mid 1980s. Uh, I think in about 2010, I was at a conference in Tromsø, Norway. And Marius was there and he came up to me and he said, you know, I wanted to thank you for accepting my article. He says, I don't know where I'd be if you hadn't. And, I, I, you know, I was very appreciative. Um, but, you know, I was, I was doing my job. And that's one of the nice things, again, about being a senior member of an editorial board, that you, you can influence, you know, what happens in the field by taking your job seriously. So I, I enjoyed being editor-in-chief, although I have to tell you, I also enjoyed stepping down. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I stepped down at the right time. In other words, I didn't overstay my welcome. I was still doing a good job. Sometimes an editor-in-chief can stay too long. I didn't do that, number one. And number two, I found two incredible co-editors-in-chief to take the place of, of, of me. And I, I did it with Doug Shear um, for that 21-year uh, period of time. And, and so our replacements are you know, equally as, as, as good. So I feel good about that. Yeah. Claudia Arquette and uh, Luis Gouveia, right? Yes. Very nice people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're nice people. Excellent choice. Talented, yeah. yeah and yeah. so I feel that we've handed the baton yeah. to a really good pair. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that story uh, involving Mario Solomon is just incredible. Uh, I'm thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, that, oh. that's that's a very nice one. Um, and it's I mean, too bad that he's gone. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know. He, right. he, he left too soon. Yes, yes. He left too soon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the, that job uh, of, you know, managing so many papers and keeping track of backlog and, you know, things like that, it required a tremendous amount of effort for sure. Uh, and I, and I, I, I asked myself, uh, I mean, how many hours uh, do you sleep per day? And I know you seem to be a night owl, <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Well, I am a night owl. Uh, but I still need a fair amount of sleep. I mean, I have friends who tell me that they only need five hours of sleep. I was never like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I need seven and a half, eight hours of sleep. It's just that, you know, I work till 5.30 in the morning and then I sleep till one. Okay. <laughs> typically. So whenever I teach, it's always in the afternoon. And I've been able to manage that, you know, forever. I mean... When my children, when my daughters were little, they liked the fact that the house was always open, right? There were always lights on. There was always someone up. Uh -huh. So if someone had a bad dream, well, dad was up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm a night owl myself, and I'm known for that. So uh, that's also thank you again for sharing that. So people maybe have more sympathy for me. That's it's not uh, uh, it's not just uh, it's just how we work, right? I think we feel more productive it's, exactly at night. It's it's just how it yeah. is. Uh, that's why yeah. we're talking now. Uh, you know, it's been all the way after midnight for both of us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's going to be for you, but it's already for me. So it's yeah. close. It's right. close. Close. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, um, I mean, so you were, since you were talking about networks, uh, could you briefly summarize the story of the journal? I think it's, it's, it's yeah. to be important. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it turns out that I've been affiliated with networks in one way or another from the very beginning. So what happened was when I was an undergraduate uh, in 1971, 
I was taking a course in combinatorics and graph theory. And one class, my professor, he runs into the class and he says, look at this. It's the first issue of a new journal. It focuses on exactly what we're doing in this course. And it was networks. Okay. So I was a senior um, at Penn. The next year I was at MIT and I, I worked with Danny Kleitman. And Danny Kleitman suggested that I spend the summer after my first year of graduate school in New York interning with the Network Analysis Corporation. And I spent three summers working with them. Now, the, the owners of the company were Ivan Frisch and Howard Frank and Dick Van Slyke was sort of the third in command. Ivan was the editor in chief. Howard and Dick were associate editors. So uh, while I was working with Ivan, he'd give me a paper to review. Again, I'm in, I'm not, I haven't finished graduate school, but I'm already reviewing papers for networks. By the end of the 70s, I was on the editorial board. Um, I guest edited a special issue in 1981. And, you know, by the late 1990s, I was editor in chief. So I was um, part of the networks family from the very beginning. It's also true that until COVID hit, I had every single issue in hard copy form in my study, going back to volume one, issue one. Um, they stopped distributing the in, in individual issues because of COVID. But um, yeah, a networks uh, has been, you know, a major part of my professional life. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Uh, you mentioned uh, Professor Daniel Kleitman, the, the uh, legendary professor from MIT, and I know you have a couple of nice anecdotes involving him. Would you mind sharing them? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass him. Okay. But when uh, I was uh, in my first semester at MIT, I had this idea for a master's thesis based upon some work I had done as an undergrad. There was this conjecture that a faculty member from Penn uh, had, and I had tested this computationally, and we believed that this conjecture was true, but we weren't able to prove it. So I went to Tom Magnanti to see if he could help. He said, no, I can't help, but the guy you want to talk to is this guy, Danny Kleitman. So I went to see uh, Danny Kleitman, and um, he listened. He was a professor in the math department, um, and you know he he was the most talented sort of mathematician that I've ever interacted with. Again, I don't want to embarrass him, but that's that's my view. Um, and he he looked at the problem. He asked me to explain the problem to him. Uh, I did that. And he said, let me think about it. He says, why don't you come back on Tuesday? This was probably a Thursday. I came back on Tuesday. And he had essentially proven the result. But he left a couple of lemmas for me to prove. Now, he didn't have to do that. Obviously, he knew how to prove those lemmas because the way he proved this result was really clever. I mean, it was... It was um, a proof that I never, I never would have come up with, even if I had spent months mm -hmm. thinking about it. Um, but he left a couple of lemmas for me to prove. I went back, I proved those lemmas, and then he said, okay, we have a paper. And he submitted it. And I was very sort of excited to have my first paper. I mean, he had to submit it, but at that point I felt if he believed that it was a paper, then, you know, I should believe that also. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went back to Tom and I said, you know, I, I, I'm happy that, you know, it's it's an, a paper or at least in the making. He said, but it's a little bit discouraging that, you know, he's able to crack this over a weekend. I've worked on it, you know, for 
days and I wasn't able to make much progress. So Tom says to me, he says, Bruce, don't, don't, don't take it that way. He said, Danny Clayton did the same thing to me a year ago <laughs> and I ended up publishing a paper with him. So, you know, it's a good thing. You've got your first article and, 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 and that's just a, it's, it's a step in the right direction. And then I'll just, I'll just say that uh, the fact that he was generous enough to leave room for me to contribute, number one, and to uh, put me in a position to spend three summers with Network Analysis Corporation, number two, um, it makes me you know, quite appreciative and, and grateful. I think he's as talented as he is. Um, uh, he's also a very generous fellow. So what happened uh, later on is 2010, I was working on a problem. Uh, it had to do with the split delivery vehicle routing problem. And the uh, notion was um, how much better could you do with the split delivery than with sort of the standard problem. And I think Claudia Archetti may have I don't remember whether it was with Grazia or not, but they may have put together um, a paper on that topic. And we decided to sort of ask a slightly different question. We said, well, suppose there's a minimum delivery amount. In other words, from a practical point of view, you wouldn't split a delivery and have 99 units delivered by one truck and one delivered by another. That would never happen in practice. But suppose there was a minimum delivery of 10% or 20%. Could you prove a result as a function of this percent? Okay. And I think, and, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, positive of the details because it was a while back. But I think what happened was this parameter, let's call it alpha, we were able to analyze it for all values, I think from zero to one half, but at one half, things fell apart in our proof. So we had a proof and we had a conjecture. We thought we knew what happened at one half, but we couldn't prove it. So I tried contacting all of my vehicle routing friends. In fact, I went to a conference and asked for help and nobody could help me. So then I thought, well, who's the one person who might be able to help me despite the fact that he's retired and he may not want to hear from me at all. And I said, well, you know, I'll send him an email, see how he responds. So I wrote to him and I said, look, I, you may not be interested in this at all, and that's fine. But I have this interesting problem, and I'm wondering if you might be interested in hearing about it. So, you know, we communicated via email, and he said, yes, yeah, send me what you know. And so I did that. And a couple of months went by. Again, Danny was probably 80, we're close to 80 at the time. Eventually, he sends me a sketch of a proof. And my student and I, you know, worked hard to convert that sketch into a proof. And we published the article. But he was able to sort of f figure out how to attack proving that result. He's so, really, yeah, he's really an oracle. I mean, you, you, when you have a, a, a problem that you're stuck you, or a proof, then you go to him and he'll I think many people, the, the many people at MIT um, found their way to his office. And they probably found him to be helpful and generous in the same way that Tom and I found yeah. For the today. viewers and listeners who are not familiar with uh, Professor Daniel Kleitman, he was involved uh in, in that movie goodwill hunting uh that was in the 90s with matt damon and ben Affleck. he was the mathematical advisor on yes. that movie yes and, and he makes a very special appearance i was able to find that on the internet yes. uh, yeah very nice yes yes yeah uh 
So, uh, Bruce, a, a couple of years ago, you published a paper titled The Power of Linear Programming, Some Surprising and Unexpected LPs that was published in 4OR. What motivated you to write such paper? I mean, uh, at, at, yeah. this, at this stage of your career? Yeah, well, that was, uh, that was a very satisfying paper for me. Um, the reason is, when, when I was uh, a first-year PhD student, I was taking linear programming for the first time. And most of my friends already had uh, a master's degree in OR. So for them, they were taking it for the second time. So, you know, I understood the mechanics of LP. Uh, we went through uh, probably a week or two of formulations, you know, manufacturing formulations and transportation formulations, and maybe the diet problem was also formulated. Um, and then we went through the algorithm and then duality, etc. So I understood mechanically um, how it worked, um, but I didn't have an appreciation for why it was so important. It seemed narrow to me. And then over time, I, you know, was exposed to different application areas. So uh, in Maryland, I became involved in fisheries management a little bit because of the Chesapeake Bay. They needed help in planting oysters in the bay. Um, we used linear programming for that. Um, they needed help in prediction and estimation. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we use statistical uh, approaches for that. And I interacted with some professors at the biological lab, which is right on the water, sort of maybe 100 miles east of the um, College Park campus. And I discovered, to my amazement, that there was a rich literature in the application of linear programming to fisheries management applications. And, you know, I was a bit stunned because here I had this colleague now um, at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory who had published articles on linear programming in the 1980s, maybe even in the 1970s. So that you know, was sort of eye-opening for me. And then I did some work uh, that, I, that I liked quite a bit with a student where we took Tom Soddy's AHP and we were able to show that if you transform variables in a certain way, you can solve the AHP problem using linear programming rather than eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which is the way Tom Soddy solved it. And I thought, well, that's pretty neat. Was right? he happy with that result? Was Tom happy? You know, Tom was very possessive about uh, AHP. I think he probably, you know, believed that eigenvalues and eigenvectors were the more natural approach. But he was tolerant of using linear programming to solve it. I, I always had a good relationship with Tom, and he, you know he he could become defensive, but I, I thought he accepted it, you know, with tolerance. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I thought again that um, linear programming was much more broadly applicable than I ever imagined back in 1972 when I took my first course in linear programming. And, you know, starting in about the year 2000, I had this notion sort of in the back of my head that one day I would write a, a paper like the one that eventually came out in 4OR. I had this notion that, that there was an interesting paper to write. And not only that, that I wish I could have read this paper back in 1972 when I was studying linear programming because it would have – It would have enlightened you, maybe enlightened me. I would have recognized back then that this is not so narrow a tool. It's much broader than it seems at first glance, right? So anyway, it was sort of on my back burner. Um, 
but one quality that I have that I think has served me well is that I am persistent. So I didn't forget about it. You know, I didn't say, well, okay, it's not important. Let's move on. It, it was on my back burner for many years. And I was invited to give a keynote lecture in uh, Italy. Uh, when was it? 2019, I believe. And the way that works, as you know, is they ask you nine months in advance to give them a title and an abstract. And then, you know, it's up to you to prepare the, uh, the talk. Well, I said to myself, you know, if I ever, you know, want to write that paper, you know, now would be a good time. So I gave him a title, you know, something like the power and flexibility of linear programs or linear programming. I gave them an abstract. I had nothing written down beyond the title and abstract, but it forced me over that summer to work on this. And I, I'm very proud of the paper. You know, I, I wouldn't say that it's my best paper, but it's one of my most satisfying papers because uh, I eventually <laughs> finished writing this paper, which I had imagined in my head like 20 years earlier. Wow. So, um, yeah, and I, I was able to do it with, with f friends and a student, and so we had fun writing it so very satisfying uh, in, in general very satisfying yeah yeah nice. so bruce uh do you have any regrets any regrets um small regrets not large regrets right i mean i should have sent you know this paper to maybe a different journal um but you know in all, I, you know, I can't say that I regret coming to Maryland. I mean, I think Maryland has been good for me. It's been a good place for me. I mean, I've had my issues, you know, with um, deans um, and department chairs over the years. But uh, all in all, I, I, I can't regret uh, coming to Maryland in the first place. And I had opportunities to leave. Um, I don't regret not leaving. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I, I don't have a lot of regrets, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, what are your plans for the future? Well, I mean, after we finish this call, I'm going to work for a few hours, right? Because I've still got about five hours of work ahead of me. Um, you know, I. I'm asked by my contemporaries, you know, whether I've thought about retiring. And my answer is that, yeah, I've thought about it, but I'm not ready. Um, I still have, you know, fire in my belly. There are still things I, I want to do. I think I'm still, you know, fully capable of doing those things. Um, and some of my friends have told me that, you know, for them, they simply ran out of gas. They, they reached a point where they just didn't have anything left in the tank and they weren't as excited about working with PhD students and writing another paper wasn't a big deal to them. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't reached that point yet. I imagine that, you know, when I get there, um, you know, I'll, I'll know it. Mm -hmm. So Bruce, uh, as we approach the end of our conversation, uh, do you have any recommendations uh, to the young operation researchers out there? Yes, I, I, I do. I mentioned persistence, right? I mean, I think that's a, a trait that has, has helped me. Um, the LP paper was one example. I'll, I'll give you one other example. Uh, back in like 2003, I read an article by Tom Willemain where he, he did something like the following. He said, if I want to estimate the uh, optimal solution value to traveling salesman problems, let me generate 1,000 or 5,000 random tours and look at 
the standard deviation. Okay, and let's see if I can build a regression line that has the standard deviation as the predictor and the optimal solution value <clears throat> as the dependent variable. And he was able to show that for, you know, 20 or so Euclidean TSP problems, it worked pretty well. So I read this article in 2003, and I thought to myself, well, why is that? It doesn't make much sense to me that the standard deviation would be a predictor. I could see the mean being a predictor. I could see the minimum being a predictor. Why the standard deviation? And so again, I put that on a back burner. And in the last few years, I've been working with a PhD student with a background in statistics. And we've analyzed this problem and a variety of related problems. The first thing is we've answered the question, why does it work? And it turns out that this standard deviation is related to the square root of n times the area, which is a predictor that comes from the old Beardswood Hammersley result from the mid 1950s. So we were able to show that. And then we were able to look at a wide range of problems, not all of them uh, Euclidean, uh, but some non Euclidean TSPs. And we added the mean as a predictor and the min as a predictor. And we find that we can come up with predictions that are amazingly accurate, despite the fact that some of the instances have 50 nodes and others have 500 nodes. And some of them have depots in the center. Others have depots in the corner, et cetera. Okay? So I think we've written like four articles together. But it's another example of a very sort of satisfying series of articles because this stems from the article that Tom Willemain wrote in 2003 and I shared our results with Tom and he was very excited to see what we had done. So um, I think persistence is is a good trait. Um, I think it's uh, it's very valuable, it's very helpful and I would just recommend that even if you can't solve a problem now, you don't have to give up on it forever. Just, you know, put it on the back burner, put it on a shelf where you have your other interesting problems to look at on a rainy day. And and then, you know, you, you can see. Uh, maybe uh, one day you'll have a different co-author. And he or she will have an idea that will enable you to make progress on that. The, the, the other, I guess, recommendation is, I guess, not at all surprising. And that is that um, vehicle routing researchers should try to connect with the real world. They should try to do con some consulting. I mean, there are too many articles that look at a paper and add a twist and publish the article, despite the fact that this new article is not generally um, likely to represent a real world problem. Okay. So, for example, if you have um, a problem and you add fuzzy numbers to the problem. Okay, well, mathematically, that might be interesting. And, you know, in some cases, that might be enough. Okay, but as a rule, I think if you could spend a little bit more time thinking about, okay, what's on the horizon, right? I mean, just think about where we are with drones and robots, right? Um, Flying taxis. <laughs> flying taxis. It's not that difficult to read articles about anticipated 
problems that we will have to face as a society. You know, for example, here's a, a, a an article that I read just in the last week or so. It was talking about um, the problem that electric vehicles uh, will face if there aren't enough charging stations. So the question was posed, well, can you bring charging equipment to either the home or, you know, a local meeting place rather than worry about erecting, you know, larger um, charging stations all across the country? Just as, you know, if I talk to my, um, my medical doctor, if I go visit my medical doctor, he has a portable device that's like an x-ray machine, right? So I don't need to go to a special office. He has this device and he can tell me, you know, things about, you know, whether my organs look right, you know, whether my bladder is full or empty. Um, and so if you imagine that um, the new technology uh, will continue to create new vehicle routing challenges. Try to think about those challenges and then maybe work on problems that are, you know, maybe just a step or two uh, away from the current uh, state of the art. Or, you know, if possible, work as a consultant. Try to figure out what are the issues facing, you know, uh, real world drivers. I mean, for example, just the simple notion that drivers prefer right hand turns to left hand turns. A left hand turn is more dangerous if I'm in a truck. And so many organizations won't allow or will rarely allow left hand turns. Well, you know, the vehicle routing literature pays little to no <laughs> attention to that real world issue. Right, but the more consulting you do, the more you discover some of the issues that just make the work that we do even richer when you when you include them. Um, maybe a final suggestion is for young faculty um, or young graduates of a PhD program: figure out what you're good at and what you want to do. Right. If you're good at research, you want to do research, that's fine. But if you like teaching, well, that's fine, too. I mean, find a school that will allow you to shine as an outstanding teacher. Um, if you like working on real world projects, that's fine. Find a, a challenging job in industry. Um, I have a former student who went into industry. Uh, and he has done very well. But 10 years after his PhD, he tells me what I'd really like to do is teach. He says, I think I'm really good at it. Um, now, I don't want to get back into research in a major way, but I'd love to teach, you know, operations research. So figure out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Okay, if you don't want to become an administrator, at the university level, then, then don't. Um, if you do, well, just think about what you want to accomplish and what you're good at as soon as you can. So those are, I guess, three pieces of advice. Yeah, very valuable pieces of advice, uh, Bruce. So... Well, uh, I would like we, to thank you so much for this are we wonderful ready? ride. Are we ready for the second half? <laughs> I think I think we had enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, as I said, thank you so much, Bruce. I mean, these are just uh, wonderful stories, uh, wonderful recommendations, uh, wonderful reflections. So. I can't thank you enough for your time. And of course, I, I didn't expect less from you. You were a legend from our field. So thank you so much, uh, Bruce, for, for your time. Yeah, thank you for making this happen. Um, it was fun um, and it forced me to 
travel down memory lane a little bit anyway. Yeah. So thanks again. Yeah, my pleasure, Bruce. So uh, I hope to meet you in person soon. Last time we met was in Spain, uh, uh, 2019, actually. Oh, uh, we met at Se Sevilla. Yeah, exactly. So, oh, that was great. Great, yes. So let's that see was if, really nice. If yes. we can meet uh, anytime soon. So yes. take care, take care of your health, and I wish you all the best. Uh, okay. Ciao. Muito obrigado. Same to you. Thank, thank you very much. Yep. Bye. Bye.